Alaska Insight is supported in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers just like you. Thank you. Alaskans will elect the state's next governor in November. There are difficult questions for the state's future, such as what's the best path to ensure a strong economy and a healthy, productive workforce? How should the state pursue resource development that is safe, sustainable, and considers all users? And what should be done to handle crime effectively? That's coming up tonight on Alaska Insight. Hello, and thanks for joining us for Alaska Insights' second season. I'm your host, Lori Townsend, and tonight we're kicking off a series of programs featuring discussions with the candidates vying to be Alaska's next governor. Tonight's guest is Republican Mike Dunleavy. This evening, we'll learn more about his ideas for Alaska's future. Let's start with some background on candidate Dunleavy. Alaska Public Media's Zachariah Hughes visited Mr. Dunleavy's home outside of Wasilla recently to learn more about his life. There was brush and saplings all around here that we brush hogged all the way back. Mike Dunleavy and his wife raised their three kids on 45 acres in a quiet corner of Wasilla that backs up against the Talkeetna Mountains. Their three daughters are grown now, and the last few years, 57-year-old Dunleavy has been gradually getting rid of animals, all the way down to selling off his mules last year as he prepared to run for governor. If we're going to campaign, we're going to have to have time, A. But also the kids were gone, and the kids took care of them when I was in Juneau. This is a far cry from how Dunleavy grew up in downtown Scranton, Pennsylvania. The son of a mailman and city clerk, Dunleavy was one of four brothers. A love of the outdoors brought him to Alaska right after college, first to a logging camp on Prince of Wales Island, then almost two decades in western Alaska. Was out there for, like I said, 19 years. Dunleavy was teaching in Koyuk when the price of oil collapsed and saw up close the impact that state cuts had on the bush. Inventory got smaller. Basically, you could, you could feel it. You didn't know if it was uh, if it was going to come back. Dunleavy met his wife Rose during a basketball tournament in Nome. She grew up in Norvik, and their courtship happened through bush flights and snow machine trips. Eventually, they settled in Kotzebue, where Dunleavy moved up the ranks from teacher, principal, superintendent. Okay. Mm -hmm. In 2004, they moved onto the road system. I worked uh, with the Matsu uh, School District for a couple years. Um, as the administrator for their homeschool, public homeschool program. As a superintendent dealing with a board, Dunleavy got his first exposure to politics. I was always in public service. I mean, that's what teaching is. Mm -hmm. you're, and, and, and then when you're a principal and superintendent, and you're always trying to figure out, at least I was, always trying to figure out a way to help make schools better. He ran for school board and started down the road that brought him to the state senate. But he draws a line in his political life back to small rural classrooms, looking for solutions to social disparities that he saw starting in schools. For me, it was a continual journey to figure out how to help folks, why is this happening, and you come to, uh, you know, you come to some conclusions that's a systems issue. Now he's hoping to do that as governor. You just heard about Mr. Dunleavy's life as an Alaskan. Now let's hear more about his thoughts on the future of Alaska, should he be elected the state's next governor. Mr. Dunleavy, thank you for joining me tonight. It's great to be here, Lori. Thanks for having me. Well, start off by telling us about your early career here in education in Alaska and how that's informed your ideas for what you'd like to do if elected governor to help students in both rural and urban Alaska? That's a great question. So in the 80s, I was in a little town called Koyuk on the Seward Peninsula. It was a fantastic place, terrific people. It was an Inupiaq Eskimo town, probably about 275 people. Still have a lot of good friends there, some of my former students who are obviously older now. But um, I always wanted to help people. I always wanted to help kids, and that's why I went into uh, education. And um, I felt like I died and went to heaven when I ended up in Koyuk. Terrific people, terrific kids, a terrific uh, setting. I love going hunting and fishing with uh, folks from the town, and uh, uh, we're still pretty good friends today. So w when, I, when I examined what was happening in rural Alaska, especially in the town I was in, in terms of education, to me it was somewhat fascinating, because here you had some of the toughest people on the face of the earth at one time. 
it could be argued that uh, uh, Inupiaq folks, as, long, as well as our other Alaska natives, they knew how to master their universe, their, 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 their environment. And, and some of my kids were struggling with school. And so, you know, you say to yourself, are they struggling because they just don't get it? Are they struggling because of the system? And for me, uh, to me, it was a systems issue uh, for, for many of our students. Uh, the kids are pretty smart kids. The kids are pretty good kids. But um, when you have very, very small schools and you have limited curriculum and limited opportunities, um, oftentimes it, um, it, it doesn't have the positive impacts that you would hope uh, uh, the educational system would have for these folks. And so that started my journey in, in terms of policies. Um, what could we do to help folks, not just in rural Alaska, but what could we do, help, do to help kids all over the state of Alaska? And so when we flash forward today, we look at where we are and some of our, edu our educational outcomes, for example, in reading as per the NAEP test that was um, um, uh, given, uh, it's given every couple years for fourth and eighth graders, our fourth grade reading scores are some of the lowest in the country. To me, this is a systems issue. And I think what we need to do is we need to get back to focusing on basics, and that is making sure that kids are able to read at grade level before they exit third grade. So when they get into fourth grade, they are reading at grade level. They would be reading at grade level nationally in any state. That's what we have to focus on. And then when we go into ninth grade, for example, we have to make sure that our students have an opportunity to be proficient in algebra. Algebra is a gatekeeper course for the sciences, for engineering, for mathematics. And if we can do those two things, just those two things, we will increase um, our chances of having our kids to be very successful in any endeavor that they want to pursue in life. And then of course in high school, if we can um, get back to some more career education, career tech education, because we are a blue collar state, I think that's gonna help our kids as well. What do you think the intersection should be with uh, cultural connections to curriculum? Helping kids better understand their world by incorporating Alaska Native culture, traditions, teachings into curriculum. Do you think there's a place for that and how big a place should that be? I think there's always a place for, for people and students knowing who they are, knowing where they came from, knowing that they are a, you know, a distinct uh, uh, people in, in our Alaska family. Um, I think that's beneficial. At the same time, uh, we, uh, we, we still want to continue to help students read and um, do, become proficient in math, as I mentioned earlier. I think it's not a um, either or. I think both can occur, and I think if both occur well, you get a well-rounded individual that ends up graduating from our schools. You were on Talk of Alaska this week, and during that program you said that taxes shape behavior and we have to be careful not to drive Alaskans out of the state by imposing taxes. But shouldn't Alaskans pay something out of their own pockets for their necessary and beneficial state services, highway maintenance, law enforcement, education? If not, don't we end up kind of becoming a state of freeloaders where citizens expect to get hmm. everything for nothing? I, I don't necessarily agree with that. So for example, if you live in a municipality, you pay taxes. Um, you pay either sales tax, you have property taxes, et cetera. Uh, for example, I live in the Matsu. We contribute to schools. We contribute to our, our municipal government, our borough government. So we do pay taxes. The concern I have is that Alaska is a high-cost locale to begin with. And the moment you start taxing those that work, those that are producing, there is a, there's a good chance that they may look elsewhere, uh, lower 48, for example, to move to, to be able to continue to make, uh, make money and be employed but not have to pay as high a tax burden. Things cost a lot in Alaska. Our health care costs are upwards of six times higher than the rest of the lower 48. Our fuel costs are higher. Everything costs more. If you add a tax on top of that, I think you will end up moving people out of the state. It's my position that we should just harness our resources, our, our gold, our silver, our, 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 our uh, rare earths, our oil, our gas. If we harness those uh, resources, if we explore more, develop those and produce those resources, we don't necessarily have to tax individuals. Because keep in mind, some can argue that we already are taxed because these resources belong to the people of Alaska. So when there is a tax put on the resources, you're actually taxing the people of Alaska by doing that. You're an advocate of leaving the permanent fund alone until when would be a question. If the regular formula brings the dividends up to three or four thousand dollars in the future, is that, do you think that's healthy for our society here? Allowing folks to spend their money on the things they want to spend their money on, I think, is healthy. 
Um, if you're going to have dividends of two, three, four thousand dollars, that means that the permanent fund is a pretty healthy fund that it's making money for Alaska and for Alaskans. And keep in mind, the other 50 percent of that earnings could be used for government. So if you have dividends of three or four thousand or five thousand dollars, that means the government side of the fund is also making money. And if people are able to spend money on their own needs, whether it's health care, whether it's repairing their car, whether it's sending a, a child to college, then there's they're potentially that much less burden on the state side of revenues to help support those individuals. I've always been an advocate that individuals know how to spend their money better than government. And Lori, trust me, I've been in Juneau. Individuals, in my opinion, do know how to spend their money better than government. You have talked about developing state resources uh, for helping to make sure that the state budget remains funded into the future. That's, of course, been what every administration is, is after. But do you think that that leaves us vulnerable to external forces like global commodity prices and the will of corporations to invest in Alaska? Sure, but that's, that's, that's the same situation for economies all over the world. We're inter interdependent upon each other. And so, yes, we still are a resource-based state and we still have to deal with the uh, commodities markets. But it is what we have. And we are a small state in terms of population. And we still have lots of oil, lots of gold, lots of rare earths. We have timber, for example, in which we have no industry at this point. We used to have a timber industry in southeast Alaska and part of the uh, Chugach National Forest on the coast. There's a demand for our resources, but I think that what we do is if we can continue to develop these resources, produce these resources, we'll create more jobs for people and get them off of government programs. We'll create more jobs and wealth for Alaskans and more revenue for Alaskans. And that'll help be able to pay for better schools, better educational outcomes. It'll help uh, pay for better public safety. We, we should be looking at diversifying our economy, and part of doing that, I think, is figuring out a way in which we're going to reduce our energy costs, for example, electrical costs. And we're awash in energy. It's, it's kind of a uh, paradox for Alaska. We have energy all around us. We sell energy. We sell uh, oil. We sell gas. Uh, we sell coal. But we, we're going to have to have a discussion as to what energy source we, as Alaskans, are going to settle on to reduce our own energy costs for our own people to be able to attract uh, manufacture, uh, manufacturing base and um, uh, value-added processes for Alaska. When you were a, a state lawmaker, state senator, you left the caucus to protest the budget. Looking back on that, are you still convinced that that was the right decision for you to make? And, and do you think that that may have implications for working with lawmakers if you're elected governor? So I didn't leave the caucus to protest the budget. The rules of the caucus were that you must agree to support the budget no matter what form it's in. When we were working the, several years before that to reduce the budget, and we were, when the Senate was working to reduce that budget and we were successful, it, um, it, it, it was no problem being part of the caucus. But when we got to the point where we were no longer reducing the size of that budget in the manner that we needed to in order to stave off a tax or stave off taking the permanent fund, I had a discussion with my caucus members and I said I think we could do more. It was their belief that it was difficult to do that with a governor that did not share their belief in, in shrinking the size of the budget. And they also felt it was, not, uh, it was difficult to do with a house that had changed. It was not interested in shrinking the size of the budget. But for me, I had to make a choice. Do I represent my people in my district or do, do I represent the caucus? And it was a difficult choice. It wasn't an easy choice. Um, these folks are my friends and my colleagues. But when that budget came out in SB 26, the bill that reduced the uh, or changed the uh, size of the PFD and the calculation for the PFD was embedded in that budget, and we did not get close to the $300 million in reductions that we were talking about, um, I could no longer support that budget. And as a result, I, um, uh, I left the caucus. And what do you think that may portend if you're elected governor for working with the members of the legislature? Um, I get along with my former caucus members. They understand that this is business, and they, understand, they, they wish. Many of my former caucus members are supporting me in my run for governor because they know that I will take the job of finding efficiencies, in eliminating redundancies and duplications in government in order to save money and save, uh, save Alaskans from a, a PFD take and save Alaskans from a tax. They're supporting me in this endeavor. They're looking forward to having a Republican governor that will contain the size of this uh, budget. Because what's happened the last several years in Juneau is it's been a fight over what to cut because the budgets have been too high. 
Once we start to reduce the budget through these efficiencies I'm talking about, then the discussion changes as to what do we really need to add to the budget. Is it, is, is it an adequate budget? Does it cover our basic uh, services and our constitutional mandates? And in the discussions I'm having with my fellow legislators and my fellow caucus members, they're looking forward to this. The governor vetoed uh, half of the, about half of the permanent fund dividend once. The legislature then came in and, and did the same thing twice. If the legislature had issued permanent fund dividends according to the traditional formula, there would have been $840 million less in that reserve for government services. Are you concerned that drawing that amount could harm the permanent fund in the future? So it, it, there's always the potential that our return on our investments will be lower than we had hoped. The, the big issue, though, is really about what is the role of government in its relationship with its people? Do we serve the people or are they there in, in a way to serve us in terms of taking the PFD and taxing them? It's my contention that we serve the people of Alaska and that we're partners in the people of Alaska when it comes to the permanent fund, the PFD, and taxes. And it's my belief that we should engage those, our constituents, our, our voters, in a discu discussion as to what we want to do with the PFD. That didn't really happen. How do we do that in Alaska? You could do it through an advisory vote if you want to change the a permanent fund or PFD. You could do it through a constitutional amendment resolution. But here's what people forget. If we don't engage the people uh, of Alaska in these conversations, they have tools to engage themselves. And that is in the referendum and the initiative on the back end of things. And that was my contention all along. Let's treat our people as partners in government, not as subjects of the government. And so if we want to change the permanent fund, if it looks like the calculations going out look like, looks like there's going to be a diminishing permanent fund or diminishing return for the PFD, let's show the people that information. Let's have that discussion and let's have them vote on what they want to do for the future in and, terms of the permanent and fund. And carrying that forward, do you think that at some point we may have to do just that and look at perhaps a limit, a cap on how much the permanent fund dividend will be each year? Possibly. It's hard to know what the future is going to bring for the state of Alaska. It's hard to know what the markets are going to do. But if that, we ever get to that point or look like we're heading to that point, again, I have no issue at all engaging the people of Alaska in that discussion through an advisory vote. Because again, if they don't agree with what we're doing, and this has been the argument that's been made, by taking the PFD or cutting the PFD or changing the permanent fund, we are able to stave off a tax or we're able to pay for government. If you don't engage the people in that conversation up front, you don't have a stable fiscal plan. You don't have a stable uh, policy going forward because the people could come in through the initiative process and referendum process and actually overturn what the legislature has done. And so it's important to have the people with you all the time in these very important issues. People of Alaska don't want to be involved in smaller issues when it comes to bills that we pass on a regular basis. But when it comes to such dramatic and substantial changes, especially when it involves reaching into their pocketbook, either through the PFD or through a tax, I think the people of Alaska should be involved. Mr. Dunleavy, you've said that you want to keep the state budget spending to roughly with inflation. Healthcare costs are rising faster than inflation. Are you aiming to slow the growth of healthcare costs and how would you do that? We have to. We, we can't, get, we, there's no way we, and, that, and this is not just for the state of Alaska, this is for the country as a whole. I don't see how um, we can continue to have growth in our budgets of 8% a year, 6 to 8% a year, and that's state spending. Overall, the budget grew by 13% last year. We are keeping up with that growth through a growing economy. Our economy is actually stagnant or shrinking in the state of Alaska. And so what we're doing is living off of savings, or we are forcing ourselves into a situation where we're going to take a dollar out of your pocket and give it to your neighbor's pocket. And it's been my contention that the way to deal with these costs is to work with folks in the healthcare industry, providers, insurance companies, all the stakeholders, to come up with a way to, at the very least, contain these costs, hopefully in the neighborhood of 2% a year, or actually reduce costs. If we can do that, then we don't have to go and tax you. And the other thing that needs to happen is we have to develop our resources. There's no way to get out of this situation or to have a future for Alaska unless we continue to explore, develop, and produce our resources. Yes, and at the same time, try and diversify the economy through a lower uh, energy cost. But that's the near term for Alaska, is developing these resources to help pay for these programs that we want. Ken, do you think the state can take steps to reduce health care spending 
without addressing all health care costs in the state, including private insurance? I don't know the answer to that. We're working on that now with groups of folks that are in the healthcare business. But for example, um, there is fraud and waste. We know that. There's fraud and waste in, in just about any government program. We can reduce costs by addressing fraud and waste. We could also look at the possibility of opening up our Alaska Care, which is our state insurance program, for all uh, governmental agencies, such as school districts and maybe city and municipal governments, to become part of that pool to drive down costs. We could ask for block grants from the federal government so that we can Alaskanize our health care approach. That also could reduce costs. These things, these issues are going to be discussed or being discussed now. But health care, we have to get health care under control. Right now it's out of control. The costs just keep growing exponentially. And the, uh, the end result is going to be a collapse of the health care system unless we can control these costs. You mentioned partnering with providers. That's where a, the lion's share of healthcare spending goes, is to payments to providers. Should they be concerned that there might be reductions to their revenue? No, as a matter of fact, when I'm speaking with providers, they're actually excited to be part of a process in which they'll have a voice. They'll have some input into policy going forward. And that's what we're looking at, engaging providers engaging insurance companies and engaging others that are part of the overall health care family, uh, as we could say, in developing policy going forward so that we can contain these costs. I haven't, I haven't talked to any provider or anyone involved in insurance or any other stakeholder involved in the uh, health care industry that believes that we can continue this type of exponential budget growth. They all are concerned that eventually it will collapse or that they will end up uh, uh, sharing the burden, or being burdened, I should say, uh, in, in addressing the reductions that may need to happen through this process. But the long story short is they all want to be part of policy going forward. They all want to be part of reducing the, uh, the, the continued cost, the, 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 the continual exponential costs in health care. They all want to be part of that conversation. So they're looking forward to it. Well, let's switch gears and talk a little bit about oil and gas. In, in Alaska, Oil and Gas Association debate earlier this summer, you said that you questioned whether the state is able to handle its lead role in pursuing the gas line, saying that uh, you don't have faith in the administration, that they're able to pull this off with the people that are in place. What did you mean by that, and what do you see as a viable way forward if you think that the state should be pursuing this gas line? So the major companies that were involved in this pulled out. And that really is a message for all of us, why they pull out. Uh, companies are in the business, corporations are in the business to make a profit. And surely if they thought there was a profit to be made under this scenario, they would have stayed in. That's my opinion, the, the opinion of others. I don't believe we have the expertise at this stage of the game. We're a small state of 730,000 people. We're having a difficult time managing our own public safety issues, our own educational outcomes, our own budgets. Um, this is a very unstable state in terms of uh, uh, industry wanting to invest in the state of Alaska. Uh, we're having all kinds of issues just managing our basic governmental functions. It shouldn't be uh, any surprise to folks that we may not have the expertise to handle the largest potential project in North America's history at 45 to 65 billion dollars. And so, no, I have some grave concerns and many others have some concerns as to whether we can manage such a project of such magnitude. Again. Um, we're going to have to get in and look at those confidentiality agreements, break those confidentiali confidentiality agreements open to see what are all the details involved in this project. What's the price of gas going to be at the wellhead? What are the Asian nations willing to pay for gas and how long and duration of those contracts are they going to be? What's the cost of the infrastructure in between? We have too many questions right now to believe that this is a project that's going to be viable until those questions are answered. But I do question whether we have the expertise. And do you think that uh, after you, if you are elected governor and review those documents, that you may say, we're going to park this project? There is a possibility. If this, project is, is, if this project is deemed to be too much of a risk for Alaska's future, or if this project does not, it, it, it's, it's not evident that it can return a dollar to the state of Alaska, uh, certainly I think any governor should park the project. But I'm not there yet until I get into those confidentiality agreements and get more of the data and information to be able to make an informed decision. And so I am still weighing whether this project uh, is viable or not uh, and due to the lack of that information. But once we get that information, we'll be able to make, I think, a pretty good decision. Well, Mr. Dunleavy, Mike Dunleavy, Republican candidate for governor, thank you so much for joining me 
this evening for Alaska Insight. Lori, it's been a pleasure being here. Thank you very much. That was the Republican candidate for governor, Mike Dunleavy. As you've heard, he's running on a campaign of public safety, better education outcomes for students, and more resource development. Early and absentee voting starts on Monday, October 22nd, and Election Day is November 6th. Each week on Alaska Insight, Alaska Public Media will go into the community to go beyond the headlines and provide perspective on the issues that have Alaskans talking. You can connect with us and watch Alaska Insight online by going to alaskapublic.org slash Alaska Insight. You can also engage with us on Facebook and Twitter. Thoughtful comments from viewers will help us determine future topics of discussion. We return next week at 7.30 p.m. right after Washington Week, where my guest, will be Mark Begich, who is the Democratic candidate for governor. In the meantime, stay informed and connected by listening to Morning Edition, The Economic Report, Alaska News Nightly, and Talk of Alaska on your locally owned and operated public radio station. Thanks for joining Alaska Public Media for this edition of Alaska Insight. I'm Maury Townsend. Good night.